Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Okay. I'd like to say welcome to Holy Trinity Episcopal Church. My name is Joshua Lowen Samuels, and I serve here as associate priest. Our parish is called by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, to encourage new disciples, to nurture those within the fellowship, and to demonstrate God's love and mercy to all. This evening we are delighted to present the first of two theological lectures in memory of the late Alfred Ring, who came from Germany to the United States at the age of 19 with only $100 in his pocket and no knowledge of English. Alfred Ring went on to become the chairman of the Department of Real Estate and Land Studies at the University of Florida. He was also a parishioner here. Alfred Ring died in the year 2006 at the age of 101. These lectures are generously supported by the Holy Trinity Foundation, which holds the Alfred Ring Endowment for Theological Education. I also wish to acknowledge our rector, Father Fletcher Montgomery, who provided oversight as we organized this project, and Dr. Brian Jandreau, president of the foundation for his commitment to our vision and his untiring labor of love. 
Tonight, our speaker is Dr. Richard Hayes, the George Washington Ivy Professor Emeritus of New Testament at Duke Divinity School. Richard Hayes is internationally recognized for his work on the Gospels, the letter of Paul, and on New Testament ethics. Tom Wright has called Richard Hayes a prince among exegetes and a jewel among friends. I've personally benefited from Richard's scholarship and it is a great honor to host him this evening. We will also hear a response from Dr. Boachi, who is visiting us all the way from the University of Manchester to deliver tomorrow's lecture. Andrew is a New Testament scholar who has published a significant volume on Paul's letter to the Galatians. And so I hope you will join us again tomorrow to hear more. That lecture begins at 7 p.m. I should also mention that we are hosting a special dialogue that is geared towards pastors, teachers, and students. Um, that will feature both Andrew and Richard tomorrow morning beginning at 9 a.m. If you are not a pastor, a teacher, or a student, but you have a burning desire to be here, um, just come find me afterwards. We'll, we'll work it out. A brief note about tonight's format. After Richard's lecture and Andrew's response, we will open up for questions from the audience. Um, then after, you're invited to join us in the parish hall just across the courtyard, or if it's raining, through the building, where you can purchase books from our speakers and have them signed. I ask you to please support their work. Um, now, before we begin, I'd like to ask our very own Chris Goddard, a Canadian composer and pianist and our assisting organist here at Holy Trinity, to present a musical offering for us. <laughs> 
Well, my goodness, that was splendid. Well, thank you very much for that amazing musical offering. Bach, I take it. Yes? Uh, anyway, it was, it was fabulous. Uh, good evening. It's a delight to be here with you. I want to add my word of thanks to the people that uh, Reverend Joshua already thanked, uh, to Brian Jandro and, and the Holy Trinity Episcopal Foundation, and to the Reverend Canon Fletcher Montgomery, and especially to the Reverend Joshua Lowen Samuels, who's done a lot of organizational footwork. I want to thank all of you for the gracious welcome that you've provided here. I also want to begin with a, a personal word. This is the first public lecture I have given in two years. We have all been emerging from what may have felt like a dark night. Uh, in, the, in these intervening two years, I feel like when I've made presentations on Zoom or whatever, it's been through a screen dark, darkly. And now, at last, face to face. <laughs> so I, I celebrate with you that occasion. My theme for tonight is to talk about what it means to say that Israel's story is scripture for the church. What do we mean when we say that? How did the New Testament authors interpret the testimony of Israel's scripture, which was very central to what they were doing? Can we follow their example? And what difference does it actually make for the life of the church? Those are the questions I'd like to ponder with you this evening. Some years ago, in a class discussion, one of my first year students eagerly offered the following pronouncement. The God of the Old Testament was an angry, violent, judgmental God who threatened punishment and demanded fear. But thank goodness, in the New Testament, Jesus came to teach us that we can love God with all our heart and soul and strength. With much sadness, I had to inform the eager student that when Jesus said that, he was quoting Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, a text that stands at the heart of daily prayer in the Jewish tradition. The, uh, occasionally I have told that story uh, and the audience laughs when I quote what the student said. Um, I find when I speak to uh, the, my own tradition is United Methodist, they don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and you Episcopalians didn't laugh either, so th there we are. But in any case, that story symbolizes a confusion that infects much Christian thinking. There's a default tendency to dismiss the Old Testament as primitive, scary, and toxic. Usually, those who hold such a view of the Old Testament are lamentably heedless of how the New Testament writers actually received and interpreted the Old Testament as scripture for the emerging early church. That problem appears not only among first-year seminary students, I hasten to add, because we often encounter it among more seasoned preachers and teachers. I'd like to share with you one particularly glaring example from an essay that was published a few years ago in a journal of resources for United Methodist preachers. The author of this article, Joseph Webb, wants to argue that we should stop using the term Old Testament which he regards as inherently disrespectful towards the Jewish people. He prefers the term Hebrew Bible. 
And he insists that all attempts to interpret the Hebrew Bible as foreshadowing Jesus Christ are simply illegitimate. They're simply misreadings. But in what sense then does he see the Hebrew Bible as scripture for the Christian church and how does he think we should use it in our preaching? Here is his answer. I'm going to quote it at some length. Forgive me for the length of this quotation. Uh, For me, as for many academics, there's a certain sinful delight in finding an article that gets everything just wrong. (laughs) So I'm going to read you something that I think gets everything just wrong. Here's what he says, quote, I do not believe we have to give up the Hebrew Bible in our preaching. Though something in me clearly wants to give it back to the Jewish people and keep our Christian noses out of it. What do we have in the Hebrew Bible? We have a classic story of a people hammering out an identity for themselves and their families and clans. So the questions for Christian preaching are not primarily these. What did God do to these people? What claims did God make on them? What rewards and punishments did God mete out to them? I pause in mid-quotation here to observe that the questions that he wants to exclude are theological questions, questions in which God is the subject of the verbs. It's telling also that Webb seems to think primarily of God's action in the Old Testament under the category of demands, rewards, and punishments, rather than, say, the categories of promise, deliverance, and blessing. I've interrupted the quotation for that aside. I continue his quotation. The questions center instead on such things as these. So here's the questions he thinks we should ask. How did these historic religious people come to frame such odd ethical notions and define God as overlooking, if not blessing, these notions? How did they come to draft and progressively refine such a remarkable religious document as the Decalogue? Pause again for my Uh, inserted observation here. The questions that he does think appropriate are what we would call anthropological questions. That is, they deal with human acts of explanation and symbol making. And the questions he approves are questions in which human beings are the subjects of the verbs. Uh, I, I, when I used to teach New Testament introduction on the first day of class, I told my students to get a three by five card, tape it on their bathroom mirrors, and write on it, it's about God, stupid. (laughs) Returning to Webb's, to complete Webb's quotation. In Christian preaching then, there's so much to draw on in the Hebrew Bible, but it's not because the Hebrew Bible is about Christ, which it isn't, nor is it even because it's about God and what we can learn about God. No, it's because it's about the human condition, about richly textured mythic stories of naming God, naming one another, and coping with good and evil." End quote. Now, this remarkably condescending account of the contents of the Hebrew Bible is formulated by an author who thinks he's being sympathetic to Judaism by refusing to claim a a Christ-centered reading of the Old Testament. But in fact, this arm's length anthropological account that he's offered us is actually as deeply offensive to any serious Jewish believer as it is to any serious Christian. Why? Because it flatly nullifies the central theological claim of Israel's scripture to tell the story of a God who chose Israel, a God who spoke to them, and a God who delivered them from slavery into freedom. Did you notice how completely absent that was of his account of why the Hebrew Bible might be of use for Christian preaching? In fact, the classical Christian theology that Webb rejects on the grounds that he thinks it's offensive to Judaism 
at least affirmed Israel's claims that God had spoken and acted. But most crucially, Webb seems not to notice that this proposed non-Christological approach to the Hebrew Bible clashes dramatically with the New Testament, which, whose authors did in fact think Israel's scriptures bore witness to Jesus Christ. That's the claim we're going to have to keep in focus. Lest we think that these are only the misinformed musings of some Methodist preacher, I want to place in evidence an even more radical pronouncement. This is from the eminent German New Testament scholar Rudolf Bultmann, who is arguably the most influential New Testament scholar of the 20th century. Here's what Bultmann wrote, and I've given you this quotation on your handout. I hope you've all received this handout. This is the first uh, quotation on there. Bultmann writes, to the Christian faith, the Old Testament is no longer revelation, as it has been, and still is for the Jews. For the person who stands within the church, the history of Israel is a closed chapter. Israel's history is not our history. And insofar as God has shown his grace in that history, such grace is not meant for us. The events which meant something for Israel, which were God's word, mean nothing more to us. To the Christian faith, the Old Testament is not, in the true sense, God's word. End quote. Those are breathtaking denials. Breathtaking. Bultmann's assertion that Israel's history is not our history would have come as surprising news to the Apostle Paul. Consider this. In writing to a predominantly Gentile congregation of converts from paganism in Corinth, Paul seeks to instruct them to understand precisely that Israel's history is their history. Here's what he tells them in 1 Corinthians 10. This on your handout again. I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now, what is Paul doing in this extraordinary passage? He's narrating the Gentile Corinthians into the story of Israel. He's teaching them that the people of Israel who were delivered from slavery in Egypt were in fact their own fathers and mothers, and that their experiences prefigured the church's, mind, uh, the church's life-giving sacraments of baptism and Eucharist. It's, it's a, a, to use the word breathtaking once again, it's a breathtaking metaphorical interpretation of the story of the Exodus. He's telling these Gentile converts that because they are now in Christ, and precisely for that reason, Israel's story has become their story. For that reason, Paul concludes this paragraph by saying, these things happened as prefigurations of us. The New Revised Standard translation of this passage translates that sentence as these things happened as examples for us. But that's a weak translation. Paul's Greek word here is tupoi, literally types, And it doesn't mean that they were just examples that we can consider. It means that they are prefigurations for the shape and life of the church. I I note, by the way, with interest, that this passage was the epistle reading in the lectionary for last Sunday, the third Sunday in Lent. Uh, For those of you who are, are part of congregations where the lectionary is followed, I hope that you heard this in church, and I hope that when you did, you realized that Paul was telling you that the men and women 
of Israel's wilderness generation were in fact your ancestors, just as they were the ancestors of the previously pagan Corinthians. And he was also telling us, just as he warned the Corinthians of the danger of falling into a self-centered spirituality that drifts casually into idolatry and conformity to pagan culture. That's a danger that hasn't gone away. In any case, this kind of interpretation is a classic example of what the eminent literary scholar Erich Auerbach described as figural interpretation. And here is his definition also on the handout. Now, now we're getting into deep water. This is what happens when you invite a professor to come and speak to you. Uh, you get things like this. But I actually think this is quite important to understand how the New Testament writers were interpreting the Old Testament. Here's what Auerbach writes. Figural interpretation establishes a connection between two events or persons in such a way that the first signifies not only itself, but also the second, while the second involves or fulfills the first. So they're brought together. The two poles of a figure are separated in time, but both being real events or persons are within temporality. They're both contained in the flowing stream, which is historical life, and only the comprehension, the intellectus spiritualis, the, 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 the intellectual act of bringing these events in time together, only that is a spiritual act. To put it simply, more simply than Auerbach did, to figural reading is always a matter of reading backwards, of discovering previously unanticipated correspondences between a later event and an earlier text. That kind of interpretation is pervasive throughout the New Testament, and it's crucial to understanding what it means for us to claim that the Old Testament is the church's scripture. This has been argued about for a long time. In the second century, the early church fought determined battles over exactly these questions. It fought against the influential heretic Marcion, who championed a truncated scriptural canon that excluded the Old Testament entirely because it was too Jewish. Marcion also, by the way, produced his own version uh, of the Gospels, which cut out all the stuff in the Gospels that he thought was too Jewish. The early church also fought fiercely against the Gnostics, who saw the Old Testament's God as an ignorant and inferior deity who had formed the material world as a flawed creation and they championed an, an interpretation of what they were promoting as Christianity, which is that the whole goal of Christian faith was to reject the material world and escape it into an ethereal spiritual realm. The church emphatically in its early days declared these sorts of positions as heresies. So when the early Christian creeds affirmed that God the Father Almighty is in fact the maker of heaven and earth, and that Jesus Christ was in fact the only Son of God through whom all things were made, they were fighting a battle precisely to defend Israel's scripture, to defend Israel's scripture as revelatory of the one true God and creator. They were confessing, in other words, that Israel's scripture tells us the true story of the world. This struggle to defend and interpret the Old Testament as the Church of Scripture has continued across the centuries. When Martin Luther published his German translation of the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, when he published his translation of the Pentateuch in 1523, he composed a preface explaining 
why his German readers should pay attention to the Old Testament. Here's what Luther wrote, and again, you'll, this is the last quotation on the first page of your handout. There are some, Luther wrote, who have little regard for the Old Testament. They think of it as a book that was given to the Jewish people only and is now out of date, containing only stories of past times. But Christ says in John 5, search the scriptures for it is they that bear witness to me. The scriptures of the Old Testament are not to be despised but diligently read. Here you will find the swaddling cloths and the manger in which Christ lies. Simple and lowly are these swaddling cloths, but dear is the treasure, Christ, who lies in them." End quote. The manger in which Christ lies. It's a striking image. What is Luther doing here? He's reading the Gospel of Luke's birth story figuratively. He's employing the manger as a metaphor for the manner in which the Old Testament contains Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus Christ was wrapped in swaddling clothes in the manger, so too is he wrapped in the swaddling clothes of the law, the prophets, and the writings. It seems to me that only if we frame the question this way can we begin to make sense of the New Testament's consistent assertion that the Israel scriptures bear witness to Jesus Christ. He is the treasure who lies figuratively wrapped. But if he is wrapped, that suggests he's not only contained, but perhaps also partly concealed within the manger. So it's our task as readers first to enter the humble surroundings of the stable, as did the shepherds in Bethlehem, and then to search the scriptures, to read backwards, to unwind the swaddling cloths, and to disclose the Christ who lies there. So we turn now to consider how the New Testament does that, how indeed we find the figure of Jesus mysteriously wrapped in Israel's story. Pardon me for that long sort of prefatory setting of the stage, but I think it's important to see that this has been a debated question across the centuries in Christianity and that much is at stake in the question. So, reading backwards, how does the New Testament interpret the Old? <coughs> We're all familiar with a handful of passages in the New Testament that single out various Old Testament texts as prophecies about Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, we encounter about a dozen of these explicit fulfillment quotations. In those passages, in those passages, Matthew interrupts his telling of the story with an authorial voiceover. He explains to the read, he stops telling the story and, and says, this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying. Matthew does some version of that at least a dozen times in his gospel. Now to be sure, this theme of scriptural fulfillment appears elsewhere in the New Testament, but Matthew's particular way of formulating it has exercised an outsized influence on subsequent Christian understanding of how to read the Old Testament. Matthew's formula quotations condition us to read Israel's scripture as a kind of compendium of sound bites. Sound bites that serve as proof texts that predict the coming of a Messiah. But in point of fact, the New Testament's reading of the Old is much richer and more complex than those formula quotations would suggest. In the short time we've got together tonight, I want to explore a handful of examples that illustrate the more pervasive way that the New Testament narrates stories that embody wide-ranging figural linkages between Israel's story and the story of Jesus. Given our time constraints, I will offer just three texts for our consideration. <clears throat> 
one each from the Gospels of John, Matthew, and Luke. In each of these cases, what we encounter is what I would call an aha experience that arises when the Old and New Testaments are read in counterpoint with one another. So we begin with John 2. In this passage in John, also now at the top of page 2 of your handout, uh, John is explicitly instructing us as readers to read backwards. After the account of Jesus' expulsion of merchants from the temple, John tells us that Jesus' disciples remembered a line from Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. Read in isolation, that psalm is a prayer of lament. It's a prayer for God's help in the midst of sufferings. The psalmist's reference to zeal for your house is certainly not presented as a prophecy about a Messiah or a distant future event. It's rather, (coughs) it is rather a description of the hardship and rejection that the psalmist has already suffered. (coughs) Both the Hebrew original and the Greek translation in the Septuagint actually don't say zeal for your house will consume me. It says zeal for your house has consumed me, (coughs) making reference to something that's already happened. Again, I've illustrated that on your handout. But John highlights the (coughs) interpretation of the psalm as a prefiguration of Jesus by changing the verb from a past tense to a future. Zeal for your house will consume me. Do you see what's happened here? Psalm 69, taken by itself, offers no hint that this should be read as predicting a future messianic figure who would be consumed by his zeal for the temple. The interpretation found in John is possible only as a retrospective figural interpretation of the Davidic figure in Psalm 69. John reads the psalm psalm as a mysterious prefiguration of the passion of Jesus. Indeed, he understands Jesus himself as the praying voice in the psalm. This is a, a clear instance of reading backwards. In the narrative that follows, the evangelist reports Jesus' enigmatic saying about the destruction and raising up of the temple. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then, in an authorial aside, another of these voiceovers, John offers an explanation, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. So in John's interpretation, the temple itself, the physical place of God's presence to his people, prefigures the incarnation of God's presence in Jesus. And here's what's most crucial about this passage for our present purposes, and I've highlighted this in bold in in the text you're looking at. (coughs) After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now let's be clear about this. Nobody in ancient Israel or in late Second Temple Judaism, (coughs) nobody thought prior to Jesus that the Jerusalem temple was a prefiguration of a coming Messiah. That figural interpretation of the temple is reading backwards. It's a retrospective interpretation, as John himself tells us. The disciples remembered and understood only later after Jesus was raised from the dead. Do you see what's happening here? John is teaching his readers how to read. With the aid of the Spirit whom Jesus will send after his ascension, we are to read backwards and discover within Israel's scripture a rich web of prefigurations of Jesus. Second example, Rachel weeping in the end of exile, this time from Matthew 2. Matthew 2. 
<clears throat> There's a whole string of these uh, proof text quotations in the first couple of chapters of Matthew and the birth narratives. Quite striking how Matthew front loads these things. <clears throat> Matthew, like John, points to the figural connections between Israel's scripture and the events surrounding Jesus' life. Famously, in Matthew's birth narrative, after he recounts Herod's slaughter of the innocent children, Matthew composes one of his numerous fulfillment quotations. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. Quotation there of Jeremiah 31.15. Now this short passage creates a double rainbow of figuration. Here's the first arc of the rainbow. The slaughter of the infants in Bethlehem stands in obvious correspondence to Pharaoh's reign of terror in killing the Hebrew children in Egypt in the Exodus story. And here's the second arc of the double rainbow. Matthew's quotation of Jeremiah 31 links the mourning over Herod's murders to the mourning of the matriarch Rachel, the mother of the children of Israel. She is depicted metaphorically in Jeremiah 31 as weeping over the tragedy of Israel's exile even though she li lived hundreds of years before that terrible event. Perhaps Matthew's citation of Jeremiah is also meant to trigger echoes of the larger context of Jeremiah 31 with its promise of the end of exile and the establishment of a new covenant. If we keep reading in Jeremiah 31, we hear these well-known words of the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Now, Matthew doesn't quote those words from Jeremiah 31. And so, New Testament scholars like to debate whether he did or did not intend this echo. I think he did. But here's the point that's not debatable. <coughs> Pardon me. Jeremiah 31, this is not debatable. Jeremiah 31, in its original context, is not a prophecy about a future event in which a ruthless king will slaughter babies in order to assure the destruction of God's Messiah. It's not that. What is it? It's a poetic description of the mourning of the exiled people of Israel in Babylon in the sixth century BC. <coughs> so when Matthew quotes that text and says, what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled, he surely does not mean that Jeremiah intended to predict a terrible event that would happen 600 years later. He means, I would suggest, that by reading backwards through the lens of the story of Jesus, we can see that Jeremiah's words are newly filled with unexpected meaning. The, the verb to fulfill can mean to fill up. Jeremiah's words are filled up by the recognition <coughs> oh, golly, pardon me, I'm sorry. Jeremiah's words are newly filled up by the recognition that there's a triple figural correspondence, Israel under Pharaoh in Egypt, Israel in the Babylonian exile, and Israel groaning under Herod's rule. All three of these historical events are brought together. Now, for Matthew, though, this is not just one more grim repetition of the cycle of violence in history. Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Herod, Putin. Not just one more grim repetition. Rather, Matthew is signaling that Jesus 
is the new king who has come to break the cycle of violence, to end the exile of God's people, and to institute the new covenant that Jeremiah saw through a glass darkly. You with me? You see the kind of complexity that's involved in this intertextuality between Israel's scripture and the New Testament stories. A third and, and final example for now. Jesus laments and offers sheltering wings. This example from Luke 13. It's in the midst of Jesus traveling toward Jerusalem, and he pauses to intone a mournful lament over the city. Again, on your handout. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, <clears throat> the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. As it happens, by the way, that was the gospel text in the lectionary for the second week of Lent, March 13th. So again, this is a text you've perhaps heard recently. Now, unlike the examples we've seen in Matthew and John, Luke does not, at this point, quote any Old Testament passage nor does he offer any overt suggestion that Jesus' metaphor of himself as a bird offering sheltering wings should be linked figuratively to a precursor text. But if we listen for the echoes, they come loud and clear. In several vivid biblical passages, the Lord God is portrayed metaphorically <clears throat> as a bird that spreads its wings to protect Israel. In Deuteronomy 32, in the climactic song of Moses, God is compared to an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young. As it spreads its wings, takes them up and bears them aloft with its pinions. Like the eagle, so also the Lord God guided, fed, and protected the chosen people in Deuteronomy 32. Or again in Psalm 91, the poet speaks reassuringly to those who dwell in the shadow of the Most High and proclaims in the psalm this promise, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. <clears throat> but what then are we to think when Jesus, who in Luke's narrative has never yet visited Jerusalem, laments that he has often desired to gather Jerusalem under his wings. And what are we to make of the fact that even though he knows he is on his way to be killed in Jerusalem, he does not cry out for refuge under God's wings. Instead, he portrays himself as the one whose wings long to shelter disobedient Israel. This image is one tiny but exquisite example of Luke's very artful way of uh, narrating stories that create these figural connections. The almost inescapable conclusion is that Jesus in Luke is to be identified as the embodied presence of Israel's God. I have to say that the first time I actually saw that, that that was the import of this image of the sheltering wings, it, it really knocked me over. I, I hadn't seen it until I saw it. Luke does not draw attention to the, what he's doing here. He doesn't instruct readers to track down Deuteronomy 32 and Psalm 91 in order to get it. He doesn't claim that Moses and the psalmist predicted anything about Jesus wanting to shelter Jerusalem under his wings, but he speaks this powerful image of sheltering wings and invites those who have ears to hear to listen. As we read through the Gospels on page after page after page, <clears throat> there are scores of such readings, texts where we find the Gospel writers looking backwards from the standpoint of the cross and resurrection and discovering things.
discovering images and stories from Israel's scripture that light up like stained glass when the sun shines through it. They're reading backwards under the guidance of the Spirit, and they're discerning new significances that no one could have predicted. This same kind of reading is massively attested in the church's traditions of exegesis and artistic representation and in our hymns right up to the modern era. Well, I I could go on and on with such examples, and if you want more, read my books. But the, 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 the question I want to ask in this last part of the lecture is why it matters. What difference does it make? So what? What's at stake here? I want to suggest five implications of the analysis I've suggested this evening. First, when we embrace the Old Testament as Christian scripture, it shapes us into a community with deep roots. If we ask, who are we? What tradition do we belong to? The most significant answer is not to be found in our denominational preference, not in our current political allegiance, not in our national, racial, sexual, or ethnic identity. Our identity is not even most fundamentally formed by which SEC team we root for. I hope that's not heresy here in Gainesville. (laughs) (laughs) Now I've stopped preaching and gone to Medlin, right? Yeah. Um, uh, No, if we pay attention to the unified testimony of the Old Testament and New Testament as the church's scripture, we will recognize that we are united as a community because and only because we are grounded in Israel's story. It's our family history. That's what Paul is trying to teach the Corinthians. And as Paul later wrote to the early Jesus followers in Rome, we Gentiles have been grafted in as wild olive shoots into the olive tree of Israel. That's the deepest truth about who Christians are as a people. It's much more important to say that than to say that we are Episcopalians or Americans or whatever. And because we've been grafted in, we should recognize that we are the recipients of God's sheer grace and mercy in being included in this history. The letter to the Ephesians puts it like this, quote, remember that you were once without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near, end quote we've been brought near into the commonwealth of Israel and the covenants of promise. That ought to give us both a sense of historical continuity and at the same time a due sense of humility. This point is particularly crucial at this moment in history when an angry, fearful, historically shallow Christian nationalism has become a noxious weed threatening to choke out the authentic witness of the gospel. And I don't mean just here in the U.S., though it may be especially acute in the U.S. just now, but it's around the globe we're seeing this. As theologian Stephen Turnbull has observed, quote, Christians today suffer from both a tragically thin sense of communal Christian identity and not coincidentally, a dangerously strong set of loyalties to other secular tribes. Let the reader understand. When we embrace the the second, second answer to the so what question, which I can put more briefly, when we embrace the Old Testament as Christian scripture, it anchors us in created reality. (laughs) 
The Old Testament, whatever else you say about it, is not otherworldly. God's ultimate intent is not to beam us up out of the world into the God's redemptive purpose is to create a people for his praise and ultimately to gather into one the dispersed children of God and to redeem the broken creation. Read Romans 8. It talks about our groaning along with creation for the redemption of our bodies. The resurrection of the body will be <clears throat> the fulfillment of that hope. I used to shock my <clears throat> New Testament intro class on just this point <clears throat> by doing something like this. Some bright morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Heresy. <laughs> that, that got their attention. <clears throat> Resurrection of the body is the hope that the New Testament proclaims. Uh, if you want further reading on that in a very readable form, read Tom Wright's little book, Surprised by, Surprised by Hope? Is it? Yeah, Surprised by Hope. <clears throat> Third, on the so what. When we embrace the Old Testament as Christian scripture, we learn something fundamental about who God is. The testimony of the gospel writers makes sense and has validity if and only if the God to whom the gospels bear witness is real and if he is the same God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Further, there, the gospel writers' testimony makes sense only if that God has providentially scripted history. It's because God has scripted history that these, all these figural connections back and forth work the way they do. If we may put it this way, the Gospels presuppose that in some ultimate sense, God is the author of the story of Israel. If that's not true, all these figural readings I've been talking about are simply clever imaginative fantasy. But if it is true, then these figural relations are significant disclosures of God's identity. The figural unity of the canon, Old Testament and New Testament together, is nothing other than the astonishing outworking of God's self-revelation in time and history. Fourth point on the so what front. When we embrace the Old Testament as Christian scripture, we come face to face with the jaw-dropping truth about Jesus. Through their pervasive evocations of Israel's scripture, both subtle and overt, the Gospels portray Jesus as the embodiment of Israel's God. The Gospels portray Jesus as the embodiment of Israel's God, and the way they do it characteristically is by echoing Old Testament texts and identifying Jesus with the figure of God in the, in the Old Testament. This finding <clears throat> flies in the face of two centuries of New Testament criticism. I've learned since being here that one of the previous lecturers in the Ring Lecture series was Bart Ehrman. Uh, Bart Ehrman asserts in one of his recent popularizations that, quote, the idea that Jesus was divine was a later Christian invention, one found among our Gospels only in John, end quote. That's a conclusion that can be reached. Sorry to say this. Actually, I'm not sorry. That, that, that's a conclusion that can be reached and defended only by readers who are tone deaf to the Old Testament intertexts that form the foundation of the Gospels. To understand the Gospels within their own original Jewish historical milieu is to perceive that all four of them are narrating the astounding story of how the God of Israel was embodied in Jesus. If I could put it this way, the more fully we understand the Jewish background of the New Testament, the more fully we come to understand these 
revolutionary claims that are being made about Jesus as embodiment of God. Last, fifth point. When we embrace the Old Testament as Christian scripture, we are given clues about how the Holy Spirit is at work to transform us by teaching us to read well and perceive the truth. In John 16, Jesus, as he prepares to leave his disciples, promises to send the Spirit to do what? To expand the imagination of those followers who are charged to go on telling his story to the world. This is John 16, verses 12 to 14. I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. That revelatory work of the Spirit includes, at a minimum, the role of the Holy Spirit in guiding the church's retrospective, backwards reading, Christological interpretation of the Old Testament. The Spirit will lead us to read backwards and to discover previously unimaginable correspondences between Jesus and the temple, Jesus and the manna in the wilderness, Jesus and the Passover lamb. The Spirit will lead us to read backwards and discover previously unimaginable correspondences between Jesus and the Kyrios, the Lord, who seeks to shelter Israel under his wings. This doesn't show just that these gospel writers were clever theologians. It shows that the spirit of truth was at work to inspire their poetic insight into the mysterious self-revelation of God in Jesus. And if I might dare to take that point one final step further, it would be only to say this, the Holy Spirit is still at work. That means that we, in the community of those who are called by Jesus, should learn from the New Testament authors how to read. We should learn from them a deep and careful attentiveness to story, metaphor, prefiguration, allusion, echo, irony, and paradox. The New Testament is shot through with these things. We should be close readers immersed in the language of Scripture and its complex interweavings of the Old and New Testament. We don't need to be afraid of imaginative or metaphorical readings, and we don't need to insist that the meaning of Old Testament texts must be rigidly restricted to what their original human authors intended centuries before Christ. That also means that the Old Testament's deep story of God's mercy will continue to unfold through the New Testament and across time in a way that will continue to surprise us. We have to be ready to be surprised as we are driven back again and again to read these texts with new eyes. I'd like to leave you with one last story to illustrate what I'm saying. <clears throat> I started my teaching career at Yale Divinity School back in the early 1980s. One of the most revered senior professors there was Brevard Childs, the eminent Old Testament scholar. Students flocked to Childs' Old Testament introduction course where he opened their eyes to the richness of what he called canonical interpretation, very much related to what I've been talking about here tonight. In those days, there was an oral tradition that circulated about Professor Childs. Uh, I can't vouch for its accuracy, but it went something like this. There was a student who was frustrated because no matter how hard he worked on his Old Testament interpretation papers, no matter how carefully he documented all his secondary sources, he kept getting the grade of B. Finally, he scheduled a meeting in Professor Child's office and asked him, 
Professor Childs, what do I need to do to get an A in your course? Childs sat back and looked at him for a moment. And finally he replied, become a more interesting person. <laughs> the New Testament writers testify that the Holy Spirit is making us into more interesting persons. The Spirit shocked these writers of the New Testament, shocked them out of their conventional life patterns and inspired their transformational reception of Israel's scripture. They received the scripture of Israel as a paradigm shattering but truthful disclosure of things hidden from the foundation of the world. The deep logic of the intertextual linkage between Israel's scripture and the gospels is located in the mysterious providence of God. God is ultimately the author of the correspondences woven into these texts. Correspondences that we can perceive only when we read backwards. After the resurrection, the community of Jesus' followers started reading scripture and they experienced again and again that aha reaction. Like the travelers on the Emmaus Road who heard it opened, they exclaimed, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was opening the scriptures to us? In our time, God has spoken and continues to speak through the Holy Spirit that he has sent to us. The Holy Spirit seeks to make us more interesting persons by opening Israel's scriptures to us as Jesus did to those disciples on the road. The Spirit removes the veil when Moses is read. Well, I'd also like to add my thanks to the Foundation, to Joshua, and to all the staff at Holy Trinity for this wonderful event. Uh, very honoured to be here uh, and to spend time with you all. I'm actually very greatly indebted to the work of Richard Hayes, and particularly how his work primed me to think about the narrative components of non-narrative texts when I was doing my doctoral research on Galatians. Paul didn't write stories, he wrote letters, but Professor Hayes got me to think about the backstory to those letters. Now in Galatians, of course, confronted with a Gentile congregation on the cusp of making Jewish cultic practice a pivotal element of the gospel, Paul's retort was not a simplistic assertion the supremacy of Jesus, nor an attempt to theologically distance himself or the Galatian believers from the law of Moses, nor was it even a savage denigration of those rogue teachers uh, responsible for manipulating his rendition of the gospel, although Galatians 5.12 comes quite close to a denigration of that. <laughs> Look it up for yourselves, it's rather ghastly, I won't repeat it this evening. Instead, what we see Paul doing is engaging in a reorientation of Israel's biblical redemptive narrative, refracted through the lens of the Christ event. It was through the law that Paul died to the law so that he might live to God in Galatians 2.19. It was precisely by the luminescence of the gospel that Paul could determine how the law in fact pointed to the revelation of Jesus' messianic vocation. The resurrection of Jesus, such that its plot lines, its characters, its theology, and its promises could be understood as the arc of salvation history, beginning with creation and ending with consummation. 
If you've ever seen a Hollywood movie which begins with the ending scene and then goes back to the beginning to show how the events leading up to that final scene played out, well then you'll have some sense of how the Christ event allowed the authors of the New Testament to make sense of the trajectory of the economy of salvation. Understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Then you'll be in the ballpark. What Professor Hayes this evening has called reading backwards is very much the essence of all narrative approaches to reading the biblical text. Uh, and if you want to see how Professor Hayes employed his uh, address this evening, made me reflect on a passage which he's also alluded to a couple of times this evening. In the third gospel, which will form the basis of my own short reflections on his conclusions, a passage which is as powerful for what it doesn't say as it is for what it does, and which captures in a few short verses all of Israel's hopes and dreams. In Luke 24, we read the story of Cleopas and his companion, possibly his wife, as they travelled to Cleopas and his companion are not privy to. With almost comical irony, the Risen One feigns ignorance about the events, this conversation that they're having as they travel to Emmaus. Cleopas replies that they were speaking about, and I quote, Jesus the Nazarene, who proved to be a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Luke 24, 19 through 21. In that short phrase, we were hoping, Luke, with his trademark literary artistry, crystallises the dashed hopes of a nation for these two crestfallen disciples. The death of Jesus was very much the death of their aspirations, aspirations which Luke had already grounded in the national consciousness as early as his infancy narratives in the blessings of Simeon and Anna. ...of the women's experience at the empty tomb Jesus doesn't reply with his trademark, characteristic empathy, but in quite frustrated tones, turns to the Emmaus two and says, you foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to come into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. Then in the final read of the apostolic circle, and says the following in Luke 24, verses 44 and following. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things that are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, so it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Twice then, Luke's Jesus interprets the Hebrew Bible for his followers, summing up in one of the most tantalizingly underdeveloped passages in the entire New Testament. So it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now, as New Testament interpreters, and particularly as readers of Matthew or Paul, we expect the phrase, it is written, to invite a specific quotation, which doesn't appear to happen here. The reader, rather, is left to contemplate where where on earth, in Israel's sacred textual corpus, does any right say that the Messiah would suffer and die and be resurrected with the result that repentance and forgiveness would be the substance of the early Christian kerygma? And if I were to say, turn to your Old Testament and find that passage for me, you'd either be searching for a very long time, very frustrated, or you would know instantly that it doesn't say that anywhere. So what on earth was Jesus talking about? Well, I think verse 45 is the key passage. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. 
It's not accidental that in both sermons, Jesus declares that it's in all of the law and the prophets and the writings that the messianic picture emerges. It's not that a few isolated proof texts here and there can be read as some kind of messianic identity parade. Rather, the entire biblical narrative has as its nucleus the death and resurrection of Jesus. This was the closing scene of the movie, which has now been made manifest and allowed the readers to go back to the beginning and ask, how did we get here? I recently heard a Christian preacher attempt to explain this passage and why it was that Jesus accused the Emmaus II of being slow and foolish to believe that all the prophets had written. And sort of taking on the mantle of Jesus, he started sort of theoretically addressing the Emmaus II with particular questions about his identity. Don't you understand that I am the wounded seed who would crush the serpent's head? Sort of playing on Genesis 3.15. Is it not obvious, Jesus would say, that I am the suffering servant of Isaiah 53? And I sat there in the congregation thinking to myself, how on earth would the Emmaus II, who according to Genesis 3.15, would crush the serpent's head? No matter how skilled and creative their exegetical aptitude, there is no way they could have drawn those conclusions but for their experience of Jesus. And I think many a preacher, often committed to the sort of apologetic value of the biblical prophet's ability to predict the future, assume that the Bible ought to be read prospectively. In other words, that the, the biblical prophets predicted something and now that later readers should have been able to understand. The following observations, and these are just my, a couple of observations based on uh, Professor Hayes' presentation tonight, favour this more retrospective approach that he has outlined and expand upon his conclusions. And I want to say these three things in closing. Firstly, this method of reading backwards to understand the Hebrew Bible as Christian scripture, I think, puts prophecy in biblical contexts, usually resulting from some failing of God's people. And in such contexts, people would naturally start to seek the divine will once more. A simple example, the authors of Psalm 69 and Psalm 109 could not possibly have predicted that the apostolic community would have to replace Judas by casting lots. But in view of Judas's betrayal and ancient stories and poems of their forefathers, who sought a word from God in times of uncertainty and trouble, I think it's tempting to assume that a prospective reading of scripture, a sort of future predicting angle on prophecy, sounds more supernatural and makes it active reading can sound quite pedestrian and even contrived. I would say on the contrary, that the remarkable life of Jesus could recast Israel's scriptural tradition in such creative, life-changing and awe-inspiring fashion is itself a miracle. The true miracle, however, is that the creator God raised Jesus bodily from life uh, to life from death, and that this caused such a cosmic shift that the very sacred texts of Israel themselves are transformed. I would urge serious reflection on Luke's phrase that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. It reminds me of the psalmist's prayer, which Joshua uh, in ad hoc fashion, quoted at lunch uh, today in Psalm 119, verse 18, where he asked God to open his eyes that he may see wonderful things in God's law. God's people are on a constant journey of discovery. And if we're not constantly sharpening our vision, rethinking how our sacred texts speak to new situations and opening up new possibilities, then we are limiting the Spirit's reach. What might it mean that Jesus is opening our own minds to understand the scriptures today? If we really are, as Paul articulates, those upon whom the ends of the ages have come, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, it'll be difficult to theologically situate ourselves without narratives about how the ages have unfolded to this point. Finally, and taking my cue particularly from Professor Hayes' comment that the deepest truth 
about who Gentile Christians are as a people is that we have been grafted in as wild olive shoots into the olive tree of Israel. I want to suggest that reading backwards might be an important inroad into Jewish Christian dialogue. Robust dialogue between the church and the synagogue ought not to be seen as only being successful if one side relinquishes their fundamental religious convictions. It does strike me, however, that it's precisely because the authors of the New Testament shaped their Christology on the Hebrew Bible that both of our positions as Jews and as Christians might be enriched in that dialogue. Now, without wanting to introduce ideas that we have neither the time and, and I don't have the expertise to thoroughly unpack, if, as Philip Alexander, the great Second Temple Jewish scholar, has argued, the Maccabean War, which uh, happened kind of between the Testaments, the Jewish War, which led up to the destruction of the Temple in 70, and the Bar Kokhba Revolt, another Jewish war, that, to end the exile and to inaugurate the restoration of Israel. In other words, the exile somehow continued in the consciousness of Israel, even after they had returned physically and geographically to the Holy Lands. Now, if that's the case, then the ancient Jesus movement was simply an example of Jews who had found a closing chapter to that story in the Christ event. And in this sense, we follow our ancient forebears. We are heralds of a message which provides an ending to that story of exile. Now, whilst St. Augustine's dictum that the New Testament is in the old concealed, the Old Testament is in the new revealed, might slightly oversimplify matters, I want to end with the words of Sidney Gradenhout, which in some sense nicely nuance what Augustine, I think, was trying to say. Gradenhout writes, we can liken the Old Testament to a painting which God is sketching on the canvas of history. As long as the painting is incomplete, it can be developed in various ways. That is, it is open to various interpretations. But when the painting has received its definitive shape and hues with New Testament teachings about a first and second coming of Christ, the ambiguity inherent in the Old Testament is resolved. Now every part of the Old Testament must be seen in its relation to the complete picture. Every part must be seen in its relation to Jesus Christ. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, I have a few things to say um, in closing, but we're going to have a time for question and answers before we get there. Um, because this is a big room, I wish to invite you to, to get up and come here for um, ease of access, our microphone. If you prefer to stay where you are, just stand up and shout. <laughs> Are there any questions for either Richard Hayes or Andrew? Hey there. Should I come up there? Put them You can make sure our mics are on for the recording. Yeah. Hi, um, I just wanted to thank you both so much for your uh, lectures. I'm actually, uh, I grew up Jewish, uh, reforming conservative Jewish, and so um, first of all, I just want to say that um, this is exactly the kind of content that I think is profoundly important for Jewish Christian dialogue, mm -hmm. um, and I find uh, Dr. Hayes, the quote that you read at the beginning about the Hebrew Bible, I've always thought that was kind of funny, uh, that that's kind of like the the point at which so many Christians think like they're really doing a lot of wonderful work uh, to combat anti-Semitism, I say, you know, uh, it really doesn't matter what you call it, just don't murder us. Um, <laughs> uh, well said, so, well said. Um, but I think also in addition to that, um, 
I, I also just feel like, you know, don't, don't call the God of the Old Testament uh, a wrathful monster, right? Um, and that's the most important thing for me. Um, one question that I did have, this is just something that I've been mulling over a lot recently, um, and I hopefully am not ham-fisting this interpretation, but I was curious to hear your perspectives. Um, one thing that I thought a lot about is how important the Eucharist is for my own faith, um, because it... Christ's biological body is one of the ways in which um, the salvation gets from the biological people of the Jews to all of creation, that we all come to the table and partake in the elements and then um, can experience salvation in unity together. Um, and I was wondering if there's a new, if you could interpret kind of using this, um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the term, figural interpretation of I am uh, the line, I am your God and I will be your God and you will be my people, right? Can you interpret that as a kind of like, um, I will be, uh, or you will be my people as like, you will be my, you know, biological brothers and sisters almost, like mm -hmm. Christ being the embodiment of God on earth, right, is, um, is Jewish flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that's ham-fisting an interpretation, but I just wanted to get your perspectives on that. I would say that's right. First, let me say something about Hebrew Bible. One of my good friends is Amy Jill Levine, who is a, a Jewish scholar who has now recently retired, but taught at Vanderbilt Divinity School for many years and taught, you know, she was the Jewish New Testament professor for these Christian students at Vanderbilt. And one of the things that she s says is, Jews don't call it the Hebrew Bible. It's Tanakh, right? The Hebrew Bible is a, is a Christian neologism. So it's, you know, I, I really have appreciated her perspective on that. Uh, the, the thing about uh, Jesus as Jewish flesh, which in turn is uh, what is offered us in the Eucharist that unites us with him, I think is, is a very profound point. Uh, I'm, I'm fumbling here. It made me think of a passage uh, in Hebrews. Um, um, fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father, for this Old Testament quotation, I will proclaim <coughs> your name to my brothers and sisters, and in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. So the, uh, I think that, that that sense that the, the grafting, you know, there are different metaphors that are circulating around in the New Testament, but the, the, the grafting metaphor is one that suggests an organic unity uh, and, and this metaphor of being united with Christ in baptism, which makes us all children alike of God, um, I, I think that's theologically very profound and something that we need to uh, keep in focus as we think about what's happening in the Eucharist. Do you want to comment on that? Uh no, not particularly. Uh, you, you, you said it all, except to say that that phrase which you, you alluded to, I will be their God and they will be my people, hmm. uh, often comes up in um, sort of end of exile type contexts mm -hmm. in the, I don't know what to call it now, in the Hebrew Bible, in the <laughs> Old Testament, in the Tanakh, I don't know what yeah. to say. <laughs> Old um, Testament is fine. Is I Old think, Testament actually. okay? okay. Um, <laughs> And with that in mind, thinking about how um, about how the gospel is this great final act of freedom from exile, I think is that great sort of unifying idea which does bring us all to the table. So that connection you're making between, you know, an embodied Jesus and, and, and that sort of way of, of God speaking about us as his family, I think is very profound. Yeah. Any other questions? Back there. <laughs>
to repeat the question so we have it in the recording. It um, pertains to Boltman, um, Nazi Germany, and the notion that um, Israel is incomplete and what are the consequences um, when Christian aggressors um, wish to do something about that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. We, we heard it, but our online viewers didn't hear it. Right. Um, I appreciate the question. I, I think it's a tricky one. Uh, I, I partly uh, don't agree with you on what Bultmann was attempting to do, which is to val um, Bultmann was not particularly interested uh, in, in the Old Testament roots of Christianity. And if anything, Bult Bultmann was not overtly a, a Nazi sympathizer, unlike a lot of other German scholars in his hmm? Just the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. But he, at the same time, though, he also was really trying to distance Christianity from its Jewish roots. Would you agree with that? I mean, and, and I think that that was conditioned to some extent by the political environment he was writing in. He was walking a tightrope. Uh, and I, I appreciate your suggestion, and it's something that, uh, for me at least, would bear further historical investigation as to whether Bultmann was actually attempting, in a sense, to protect Judaism by, by this disavowal of the Old Testament uh, for Christians. But um, the, uh, and, and I, let me speak more to the substance then of the other part of your question. There's, there, yes, there is a danger, I think, for Christians to adopt a kind of triumphalist perspective that would say, um, we got it all figured out now. We know the whole story. You guys didn't know the whole story, and so, so you, you've missed out. Uh, I, I, the thing I always point to to try to serve as a corrective to that is Romans 9 to 11. Because in Romans 9 to 11, Paul starts off by saying he is in anguish about the fact that his Jewish brothers and sisters have not accepted the gospel. But he works around a complex argument, three chapters of very dense, be proud because you think that you, uh, you know, have been grafted in. In fact, it's, it's the, it's the life-giving tree that you've been grafted into. And even if those branches that are in unbelief have been cut, difficult argument saying, actually, I'm going to, uh, there's a mystery I want to reveal to you, all Israel will be saved. That's where Paul ends up in Romans 11. And again, there's a huge debate about exactly what he means by that. You know, does he mean every Jew empirically who has ever walked the earth will be saved? Or is there a, a principle of uh, uh, sort of di discernment and scrutiny in which God will judge who's really part of all Israel. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, I'm not going to solve that problem while standing on one foot here this evening. But, but the, um, I, I really think the, the classic term for it is supersessionist theology. Supersessionist theology is theology that sees the church as the replacement of Israel. Uh, and that, I think, is profoundly unfaithful to what we see actually going on in the New Testament. In the New Testament, all of these writers, with the possible exception of Luke, are Jews themselves who think that they are not rejecting Judaism. They are, they are finding a, a new interpretation of that Jewish heritage in light of the cross and resurrection and uh, seeking to be part of a larger people of God. So anyway, I'm, I realize how sketchy that answer is that I've just given, but I, I think you've, you've put your finger on something very important, which is that reading back brothers and sisters with those, uh, with the Jewish people across time, 
Thank you. I saw a question yeah. from over here. Wonderful talks and tongue in cheek, uh, Professor Hayes. Would you give us professors, when you, uh, preachers, when you come to talk, not stories we could use two or three weeks ago. They don't come out for three years, but something we might use in the next coming week. <laughs> but here's my serious question. <clears throat> in my senior years, I'm pastor in a church in a little town called Wallaca. Nobody here knows who it is either. <laughs> and our Bible study lost a lot of good friends, and our friends the Methodists in this Bible study are very in the midst of trying directions to go. This most recent Bible study, somebody quoted Galatians 5, 19 about fornication and the other good Lord material and all the good material as well. My question is, how can we take the depth of the Bible knowledge you gentlemen have and drill all the way back to God's creation and find a way that we can lovingly live together even when we disagree on some fundamental human question of sexuality. Mm -hmm. Augmented, an extra layer of challenge here. Um, can, can Christians be stubborn? Um, can Christians be stubborn? Hmm. Empirically speaking, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Depends how you take that question. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, do you, you want to have a go at this? Andrew? Oh, that's right. Take okay. it over my way. Thanks. <laughs> um. <laughs> Let's just be up front. Over the course of history, humans, uh, Christians have been terrible at disagreeing. And oftentimes what happens is we, we cannot leave a conversation unless... The person we're speaking to knows that they're wrong and we're right. And as long as that kind of hubris underlies our dialogue, uh, these conversations will always be adversarial. Now, I know where my brothers and sisters in the faith are coming from when they very emphatically and inflexibly say that homosexuality is sick Anyone who engages it is you know, in, in violation of the creative order. And they'll quote Romans 1, and they will quote uh, 1 Timothy 1 and 1 Corinthians 6, and they will even quote Leviticus 18, verse 22, who are believing people who are gay. Uh, and they will take the, the same passages and say, well, they don't mean that, they mean this. And at that moment of impasse, I think that's where we kind of have to grow up. In an ideal world, and we assume that it's not ideal, but in an ideal world, there would be social space within the church for both those views to exist. I would be perfectly happy to have affirming churches alongside non-affirming churches so that people who are gay and believe can have fellowship and feel love and acceptance just like anyone else, and that what we have is a constant dialogue. There was a time, and it wasn't that long ago, where if I wanted to marry a white woman, it would have caused all kinds of furor, and people would have taken the Bible to show me that that was wrong. Somewhere along the line, we, we now turn around, well, that's ridiculous. Now, maybe a century from now, we'll turn around and say, what do you mean they didn't allow gay people in the church? That's ridiculous. I don't know, but as long as, but unless that dialogue continues in a way where the, the, the two parties have a non-adversarial relationship, then I think we're going to be spinning on our axis. That would be what, those would be my thoughts. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. Uh, interpretation of homosexuality as sinful on the basis of those half dozen texts are exegetically speaking correct. Those texts, you, there are all sorts of attempts to spin that in different ways. And, and I agree, that. they're not massively, the ones I've seen to try to spin them are not massively yeah. persuasive, to be honest. The, the fact is there are a handful of texts, and you, you've cited chapter and verse, that make it clear that 
these writers at that point condemned uh, same-sex activity, full stop, period. The question is whether that ends the discussion or whether the kind of approach to the scripture that we've been talking about here tonight opens up the possibility of taking a wider view of the narrative and seeing how, if you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there's periods of time in which uh, scripture unequivocally, uh, for example, tells the Jewish people to remain separated from the Gentiles. And, you know, in terms of marriage as an example, that, you know, marriage of people outside uh, of, of Israel's faith is, is it's so absolutely forbidden and horrifying that uh, there's a, a story um, where um, one of the very zealous Israelites uh, comes, breaks into a tent where an Israelite man is having sex with his non-Israelite wife and stabs them through with a spear. And the, the, the scripture is, is enthusiastically in, in favor of this. He's, he's warmly praised for, for what he did. Um, so, and, and yet, over time, you have the Isaiah saying, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. And you have the earliest church wrestling with this question, you know, what do you mean? You know, we're going we're gonna to have fellowship with Gentiles? Well, the spirit is at work, and it changes over time. The scripture says eunuchs are not allowed in the congregation of the faithful, Deuteronomy 23, I think it is. Uh, and then I, you get to Isaiah 56, and it says eunuchs shall have a place in the house of God, and they will even serve as priests. You can just you know, go on spinning out examples like this, where the Bible is not a, a sort of rule book that from beginning to end is strictly consistent. It's a story of how the wideness of God's mercy is being disclosed through the unfolding story of Israel and the emergence of the church. Now that doesn't end the discussion of gay people are not welcome in the church. I have to walk out the door with them, leaving in the sanctuary only those who are entitled to throw the first stone. That's, that's my view. However, then the question about should the church bless same-sex unions as marriage, that's a different question. And I, on that score, I, I would make an appeal for the same uh, thing that, that Andy has, has suggested. I, I want to read you another Romans passage that I think sheds light on this. Take your time, please. Yeah, okay. This is Romans 14. Romans 14, welcome the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. I, I, I think Paul is, is incredibly exasperated. He's saying, you people in Rome are, are fighting and excluding one another over whether you do or don't, whether you do or don't eat meat, whether you're a vegetarian or not. He, he's, he's just, you can almost hear the incredulity seeping out of what he's writing here. He says, who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It's before their own Lord that they stand or fall and they will be upheld for the Lord is able to make them stand. Uh, and he goes on and on. Why do you pass judgment on your brother and sister? Or why do you despise your brother or sister? By the way, those verbs indicate the two different factions that are involved, the passing of judgment and the judgment on the strong who think they can eat anything. And the strong are despising the weak who have all these hang-ups and, and scruples. And Paul says, stop fighting about it. God has welcomed all of you at the judgment of God. And 
So, and he goes on and on with this, but the, the, the final conclusion of this section of the argument is, he says, welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. It's an appeal to, in, in the midst of this very, you know, in, in the ancient world, and Paul is just saying, stop it. Welcome one another for the glory of God as Christ has welcomed you. So what that means in terms of working out practical solutions to what different ecclesial bodies do or don't do in terms of ordination or um, marriage, those are questions that I think we can have differences in the church. Just as we have differences over just war and pacifism, just as we have differences even over ordination of women, uh, you know, Roman Catholics are my brothers and sisters. I, I don't like it that they won't ordain women, but nonetheless, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and God will ultimately judge who's right and who's wrong. So, you know, I think we've blown this sex thing up into such a uh, identity-defining issue. It, it shouldn't be an identity-defining issue for the church it's in, in the way Andy has suggested. So that's, that's where I would go with it. I've, I've laid a lot on the table very quickly there, but that's, that, you can take it or leave it. That's what, that's what I think. I'm with Paul on this one. Thank you again, Thank you. Richard. Thank you, Andy. In Matthew 13, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Tonight, I have tasted the gifts of the kingdom of God, and uh, the Holy Spirit has been work in bringing all of us here together in ways I, I will not even begin to touch upon. We will be here all night. Um, but like the man who discovered that pearl and sold everything, I encourage you to, to go and sell everything and, and bring back with a few friends tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening and bring some cash to buy some books while you're at it. <laughs> uh, please join me in the parish hall for libations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.